and welcome back. And today, <laughs> we got another exciting one lined up. Uh, a couple of months ago, a very kind gentleman down in Houston by the name of Godfrey reached out to me and said, I've got an interesting computer. I'd like to see if you're willing to take a crack at restoring. And after he sent the pictures, I was a thousand percent on board. And so it took us a little while to get our schedules to line, but we did finally get them lined up. And I went down and visited Godfrey and it was just a treasure trove of awesome stuff. And Godfrey's an excellent gentleman. It was a ton of fun hanging out and talking with him and seeing all of the projects that he's working on. But we did get this machine loaded up and brought back to here. This is a Data Machines Incorporated Data 620 mini computer from 1965, I believe. Furthermore, we think it has a NASA Apollo program link. So there's a lot of really fascinating things to learn about this machine. But uh, before we can get into any of that, we got to get it out of here. Uh, it can't live here. I've got three cars lined up and I've got another one that needs to come in and get worked on after we get that one fixed. So this is an active work area. And with this kind of fragile machine just sitting here, it's going to get damaged. So we got to clean it up and get it into the office so that we can get to work on it in there. Now, I do want to be uh, upfront and clear about this. It may be a while before I can actually dig into this, but like I said, it can't live here. So I figured I'd bring you guys along on the journey of cleaning this up and getting it into the room at the very least. But before we can do that, we got a lot of work to do with cleaning this thing up so it's not messing up my room and making my room dirty. So, well, we got a lot of work to do, so let's just get to it. Let's start by stripping this thing down. And in this shot on the cabinet on the right, you can see an interesting rack mount CRT thing. This is actually unrelated to the Data 620, as is the rack mount piece right above it. Both of these were uh, set up as hobbyist expansions that never really came to fruition. So we're really only going to focus on the cabinet on the left. And it's about nine million little machine screws holding this thing together. But I want to strip it down because it's got 60 years of scratches and scuff marks and rust on it. While tedious and extremely time consuming, I did eventually get it completely stripped down. And the next step is prepping it for a repaint. The original paint can provide a good base for primer as long as it's scuffed up and keyed as well for the uh, primer to grip onto. But as you can see, I'm having to get deep in a lot of places. Each place where I went back to bare metal is a place where a scratch or scuff went through the original paint and it was starting to rust out. Uh, once fully stripped back, I hit the panels with some wax and grease remover, except I don't have wax and grease remover, so this is just brake cleaner. But once clean and dry, it's time to coat it in some primer. This is just flat gray Rust-Oleum primer in a rattle can that you can get at pretty much any hardware store. While that dries, I'll get to work stripping the frame of the cabinet itself back. This one is much harder to clean up because it's all sorts of complex shapes, which means I can't get the orbital sander in a majority of the spots that have rust growing. So instead I opt for a drill with a wire brush on it. This is much more tedious and if you're not careful, the brush can catch and the drill can get away from you. Also the brush tends to lose little metal strands and fling them at your face at high speed. Even my patented safety squints aren't quite enough here, so you know, safety third and all that. Once the heavy stuff is off, I went over it one more time with the sander to really get the flat sections clean. Then it also got a full coat of primer using the same paint I used on the doors. The sun was really fading though, so I let those dry overnight. And the next day, despite it being quite chilly out, was paint day. I couldn't get the panel in for color matching, it was just flat out way too big. So I did my best based on memory and got surprisingly close with the color. I just uh, thinned the paint, dropped it in my father-in-law's spray gun, and got to work. I used an entire quart of paint, which is about a liter for the metric folk out there, and I managed to actually cover everything. Each piece got three complete coats of color, and honestly, it came out looking way better than I had anticipated. With all the panels dry, let's start getting this puppy back together. First things first, I need to lay it on its back so I can get to the casters. The original casters were all seized up and misshapen, so new ones need to go on. 
I bought some brand new casters that were the same type and bolted them in in exactly the same way. But if you're looking at this and thinking the casters only use three bolts, that's a bad design. You're absolutely right. As soon as I got it fully loaded, I managed to fold one of the casters completely with all of the weight. I don't know why I didn't stop and critically think about these instead of just copying what was there, but after that I wasn't playing around anymore and I got some oversized casters and bolted them in place properly to a different part of the frame. Uh, Alright, anyways, let's get this thing back upright so we can start loading things in. First up is getting the side panels on. They have a little flat piece on the top that they hang from, but they don't actually lock in place with that piece. So if you push the panel, it can just slide off and fall. Instead of giving it a lip to hold it in place, they're actually bolted down with four machine screws per panel. And if that sounds like it's going to make life hard installing everything else, you're absolutely right. This is not a very friendly design. Uh, next up, let's pull all the cabling out of the run here. It's all held in place with these little plastic lock tabs. You just squeeze, and if the plastic doesn't explode, it comes off nice and easy. These large steel bars at the end also keep the cables neat and tidy, but they gotta come out too to get the cables out. Then it's just a little tug and all of the cables come right out. These cables are in pretty rough shape and we'll tackle them later in the build, but for now, let's clean up and install the cable run into the cabinet. And you may notice that this rack doesn't have anything to mount rack stuff to. That's because the rack mount holes are installed separately. These little clips pop over the side pieces, and then the pieces with the rack mount holes are bolted to them. Again, a very strange design, and you can get alignments all messed up this way. But let's start getting things cleaned up to mount into the rack. This particular one has a power cord that is a fire waiting to happen, so let's just cut that off for now. I'm not going for a full restoration on these pieces yet, I just want them clean enough to not get the room dirty when I put the machine in there. I'll start with just blowing out all of the dust, dirt, and wrap poop with the air hose. Then I'll give the front a spray down with Windex or Simple Green to get the heavy stuff off. And while it's not perfect, that's cleaning up very nicely. The rails to mount it into the rack are equally gummed up and filthy, so I took them out and gave them a good scrub down with soapy water and the hose. The little ball bearings were happy for the bath for sure. Once dry, I took some wheel bearing grease and used that to re-grease the bearings. I just worked it in as best as I could and the rails are sliding nice and free again. Then I bolted them in place, slid the module in, and promptly realized I had the rails one hole too low. And this wasn't the last time that happened for sure. At any rate, with the rails properly positioned, the module slides right in, and we just need to repeat this process for all of the other modules. Finally, I need to find space for it in the office, and this is a pretty monumental task given how absolutely full the office already is. First and foremost, the safe needs to be relocated. Then I need to relocate the bookshelf on the left here. The bookshelf is going to go to the opposite wall, right next to the UE1 vacuum tube computer. Being so much thinner than the safe, it actually makes the UE1 more visible, despite being much wider than the safe. But when we first put that bookshelf in place, we did it before we put the carpet squares down. So now we had to cut a bunch of new pieces to, of carpet squares to fill the void. With that done, we can get the Data 620 in its new home in between the Litten and the PDP-11. The final task is to take all the junk that was in the bookshelf and get it back in there, but this was a good opportunity to reorganize the bookshelf a bit. Some stuff didn't need to be in there, and other stuff needed to be moved closer to each other. For example, all my spare floppy disks and drives are now on the same shelf. At any rate, I'm quite happy with how the reorganization went, even if my back does still hurt. There it is. It was an absolute thrash to get it to this point. Uh, the paint on the sides turned out gorgeous. It looks absolutely stunning. Uh, so good, in fact, that the front of the <laughs> modules here looks kind of crappy. I need to go through and uh, really clean these up 
heavily. I just gave them a quick spray down to get the heavy stuff off. But uh, things like these rails here need me to sit down with some steel wool and just really polish them up. And that's going to be very time consuming. And it already took about four days longer than I was expecting to get it into here. So even though we're not going to be able to actually get to this machine in detail for probably uh, quite some time, I am very happy that it's here in the room, safe and sound, ready for for us whenever we get to it. Uh, now, since it's here, we might as well just take a look at it and see some of the really neat and quirky things about it. And well, just looking at the cards and things like that doesn't really tell us a whole lot about the architecture of the machine. Fortunately though, Godfrey's a legend and hooked me up with some documentation. This is the uh, brochure for it. And this is the actual correct brochure, Data Machines Incorporated, a division of Decision Control Incorporated. Uh, they were bought by Varian in 1966, I believe, which then made the Varian Data 620. But this predates it, meaning that this is 1965, 1964, right around there, right when the uh, Ford Mustang was brand new and taking the world by storm. Let's uh, look through this brochure just a little bit, uh, get an idea of what the machine looks like on the inside, and then we'll go through and take a look at each of the modules. And uh, I think there's a lot of really exciting and cool stuff to see in this. The uh, staples fell out of this many, many moons ago, but I have actually managed to successfully scan this without damaging it any further than it already has been from water damage throughout the years. But uh, let's dig through it and see if there's some interesting stuff to uh, unpack in here. We have six addressing modes for memory efficiency and speeds. We have 107 machine commands plus micro commands, and we have a party line IO for field plugin expansion. That's actually a really exciting exciting one. That's a really interesting way to do input-output. Uh, so let's skip ahead a bit and see if we can find out a little bit of information about how the CPU itself is laid out. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful marketing lingo going on here, but if we get to this page, we can actually see a computer organization layout right up here. Uh, and we can see that party line IO right at the top. And then we have uh, a couple of different buses. We have an S bus, a C bus, an M bus. And then we have a bunch of registers. We have a W, L, R, S, U, P, X, A, and B register. That is nine total registers. <laughs> Uh, each one is going to be used for something completely different, and that's all actually outlined right down here where it says registers. So it's a, a very interesting layout. Um, I haven't really done much reading deep into other machines of this era, but uh, I don't know. If anybody recognizes this kind of layout in other machines, let me know. I would be really curious to see if this was borrowed from something or if this is like wholly unique. If we uh, skip ahead a bit more here, we see um, right here, this is the data word format. So we can see it is a 16-bit machine. For example, the single word instruction format has a four-bit opcode, uh, three bits for the mode, and then nine bits for the address. So with 16 bits available, it would make sense for this to be a uh, hexadecimal machine, but it's not. It's actually an octal machine. And I think that's due to a couple of different reasons. One, octal was fairly common back in the day, but also this machine happens to have a uh, party piece up its sleeve. And if we look at this page here, that lays it out, bit slice. Uh, they explain it up here, bit slice is a technique whereby all the arithmetic unit and operational register circuits associated with one bit are packaged on two cards, which are mounted vertically and in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the bit positions on the control panel. Uh, that's a whole lot of wordy words, uh, but bit slice essentially means that this is not beholden to any specific bit width. Uh, this was a technique that was very common in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Centurion used it with the AM2901, uh, as did DEC. They loved the AM2901. These are all 4-bit bit slice ALUs. The idea is that you just stack multiple ones up to build whatever bit width you want. But this is bit slice on a 1-bit level. Uh, but I think they only ever offered it as a 16-bit and an 18-bit machine. But let's skip ahead a, uh, a little bit further here. 
Um, and we get to this page right here in the center that says uh, data 620 specifications. Um, and here we go, 16 bit standard, 18 bits optional. That <laughs> really threw me for a loop the first time I read it. But memory here says uh, magnetic core. So this is a core memory machine. Finally, I have my first core memory machine in the room. 512 words minimum. 4,096 words standard. And if we look at the front of the core memory module, it says 0217777. Uh, in octal, that comes out to 8,000. And one word is 16 bits. So we have 8K of memory or 4,096 words. So there we go. We've got our standard memory set up going on right here. <laughs> That's very cool. Uh, if we flip to the next page here, this is the full instruction list. And uh, they're split up pretty logically. You got load, store, arithmetic, logical, jump, uh, jump and mark, execute, immediate, all the way down the list. Um, I'm not a programmer, so a lot of this is lost on me. So uh, I'll put a, a link in the description below to this full document. So if you guys want to go through and look at what the instruction list is, uh, knock yourself out. Uh, like I said, most of this is lost on me. So we'll keep... Uh, Moving on along through here, there's some information about the party line here. It's a bi-directional thing. Um, here's the system organization. And again, there's that party line IO bus. But what I'm more fascinated about is what plugs into that party line IO bus. Uh, we have the TTY here, which is a teletype. And that's actually something that I'm missing. And we're gonna have to address that a little later. Um, but we've got a buffered IO channel, a tape controller, uh, sense and control lines, priority interrupts, a plotter. Mm, that's really fascinating. Uh, and then we get up here to an uh, analog digital converter, a high speed printer, and a disk memory? This thing had a disk memory option in 1965. That is bonkers, but I would love to get my hands on it, which again raises the question, if you didn't get the disk memory option, what were your options for mass storage? And uh, they actually have some of that outlined here as we move closer towards the back and get into the peripheral section. Um, we can see here that there is a 120 inch per second magnetic tape unit, a 45 inch per second magnetic tape unit, and a 300 character per second paper tape reader. Uh, but they have a full list uh, over here. So they've got um, all sorts of different TTYs and high speed things that you can add to it. I mean, the, the thing goes on forever. Uh, and the TTY that it was expected to use is an ASR33, which we can see here, ASR33 TTY unit with adapter. So they were expecting it to use the ASR33, which is something that I don't have and really need to kind of get my hands on. Uh, and that brings us to the end of this brochure. There's a lot more in there to uh, read and check out. So check the link in the description below if you want to read through that. All right, let's uh, start at the bottom and work our way up with the modules. This is the memory power supply. So this is just the power supply for the core memory up here. Uh, but what I love about this module the most is this little sticker right on the front, which says NASA verified C logbook 620 power supply. There we go. Hard proof that this machine was used at NASA. That, I mean, 1960s NASA high probability that this was used for something on the Apollo space program, which is really exciting. Uh, so if we go ahead and pull this unit out here, uh, you can see it is a beast. The transformer over here is massive and weighs an absolute ton. We've got huge filter caps right over here. This corridor here, I find a hilarious way to build it. There are a bunch of uh, power transistors in there with cooling fins sticking off and then a fan on the backside. So air is forced through this tunnel where all of the power transistors are trying to keep them cool. But as you can see, it is in rough shape. Everything is going to have to come out of this. Um, the PCB on the front here is probably fine, just needs a little bit of cleaning up, but there's a lot of uh, other electrolytics hanging around in here and a lot of really interesting things going on like this contactor here. Uh, th this is probably going to be the starting point, making sure that this power supply comes up and the primary power supply, which is uh, further up. So boy, <laughs> we're starting to get an idea of the mountain that we have to climb. 
This is the IO control box. Uh, we have some interesting ports right here on the front it says A, B, enable and interrupt. Absolutely no clue what those ports would be used for. Uh, I don't really know, but we'll go ahead and slide it open and we get our first look at some of the proper logic cards of this machine. And <laughs> these are awesome. They are full on transistorized cards, not a single integrated circuit anywhere on here. And they are just absolutely stuck in there. There we go. That one came out finally. Uh, so yeah, there we go. We can see a row of metal can transistors. Those are most likely germanium. We have a row of diodes on the bottom. Again, most likely germanium. Um, and then some mica caps, I'm gonna believe, with more diodes next to it, and then a bunch of resistors along the top. I have absolutely no clue what this does. On the back, it says VersaLogic GA112-2. Uh, and then we can see the decision logo here on the top. Really beautiful design. It is a single-sided PCB, um, but the connectors are intense. They've got uh, two rows of connectors that are all mounted onto one side. And it has these really wild sockets that I've never seen before. Very cool though. Um, now there are only two rows of uh, cards in here, but there looks to be a space for a third row. And there was one more IO control box, but it didn't have any cards in it. And it just had a single row for the back plane. So maybe we can take that one and transplant it into here. But this this should be what a teletype plugs into. So there's a couple of ports on the back here, and I think those are the ports that a uh, the ASR33 teletype would plug into. So, all right, now we're up to the real party piece. Core memory. There's that zero to one seven 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 sticker. Otherwise, on the front, there's really nothing of note. So let's just go ahead and slide this thing out. It has a very strange <laughs> slider system, but Oh man, <laughs> yes, there we go. There is the core memory stack. Absolutely stunning. Unfortunately, we can't see any of the cores because they are sandwiched together very tightly. Uh, we can see the X and Y lines though. These are the rows of exposed pins that are going this way and along the top. And then you can see the absolute insane collection of wires that is necessary to make all of that work. Uh, above and below this, there's a collection of cards that look like they have uh, little transformers on them. So these are probably the uh, sense amplifiers. Uh, but this is not the control logic. This is just the uh, necessary gubbins required to actually flip the cores or read what actually got flipped. So uh, all of the control logic for this is on the other side. Again, this uses the same construction as the IO panel that we saw below with uh, discrete cards plugged into a uh, wire wrapped backplane. Uh, up top here, there is another box with some big heavy duty power transistors on it and a fan. So mm, I don't know, the, maybe there's some extra power regulation that's going on up here as well, in addition to the core memory power supply that we saw on the bottom. Uh, there are some unpopulated slots right in here, but looking on the back, I can see that those slots aren't even wired up. So those aren't supposed to be populated. Uh, now there's the big burning question of, this is 4,000 words, could we upgrade it? And I did actually get a second upgraded core memory box with it, but that would require a complete separate cabinet of its own, and I don't want to put a second cabinet in here. But could we put that extra core memory stack into this one in the spare space on the other side? I don't know. That's something that we'll have to look into the future, but it would be very cool if we could. This is the front panel, obviously. This is where the user is going to interact with the machine in various ways. We have our power switch here on and reset. We have some operation switches here. These are loose, so I don't want to push those. Um, we've got some control switches down here, repeat, and whatever that is has faded away into oblivion. And then we have our sense switches, which are all locked up with the exception of the interrupt switch right here. Um, those are big power switches on the bottom, but these are also all switches. Each one of these can be pressed. 
Uh, now, I'm guessing that this is kind of like the front panel on, say, something like the PDP-11, where you could uh, maybe set the instruction register to a specific value and uh, go to it and do something like that. I have absolutely no idea, but that's the only thing that makes sense by having actual push buttons on the front. Now, I thought this panel looked a little dumpy with these switches at first, but if we look at the uh, brochure here, we can see that those switches actually look a little weird some are different colors than others and then it dawned on me that these aren't just push buttons these are also lights so on the pdp 11 you had the toggle switches and the lights but on the data 620 they're all wrapped up in one that is really cool and i think this is going to look absolutely stunning blinking away with all of the lights on or off and you can go up and push the actual light that you want to push I think that's really cool and intuitive. Uh, but what's behind this? Well, not much. We'll go ahead and pull it all the way out here. And you can see it's just the supporting circuitry for the front panel switches. Uh, each switch looks to have like a tiny little card that has two transistors, resistor, and the uh, toggle switch on it. And there might be a couple other components in there that I can't quite see, but each switch has one of those and that goes for all of them. But that's only in this first part right here. The rest of this is power supply. You can just see the big honkin' transformers uh, beneath this metal cage. Uh, so this is the next power supply that we have to ensure is working correctly. And that power supply is, I believe, the primary power supply for the I.O. control and the processor. And the processor is the piece right above this one. The final piece of the puzzle is this box right here, says central processor. They put a little sticker on here that says P1. Somebody wrote 73-202252 something. I actually tried to remove this magic marker. I tried IPA, that didn't work. I tried brake cleaner, that didn't do anything. So I'm gonna have to get pretty aggressive to get that off, but I wanna make sure I don't remove the actual gray paint behind it. Um, I don't really know how to tackle that. But but uh, let's go ahead and pull the central processor out. And like the core memory, it has a very weird rail system that's actually on the top and bottom and not on the sides. So if we grab this, slide it out, boy, that feels precarious. But there we go, we have the full processor out and you can see it is just a ring of cards down the side here. Um, so if we pull this one out here, this is a pretty interesting looking one. This one says ARI01 on it. There we go, ARI01. I am guessing that this is part of the arithmetic unit because we have a whole collection of them here that say ARI010202, 02, 02, uh, all the way down there. So this might be half of one of the bit slice ALU things. It is fantastically complex. A ton of uh, germanium transistors and germanium diodes for wonderful DTL logic. Very, very cool looking card. Uh, and well, as you can see, there's two rows on this side and two more rows on the other side. But if we have uh, two rows of cards here and two rows of cards on the other side, how do you get to the back of them to wire up the backplane? Because it is all wire wrapped. Well, the reason that this one has uh, rails on the top and bottom is because it can split completely open. Look at that madness right there. <laughs> We do have a few loose wires over here. That's probably not great. Um, but we have a bunch of test points right here in the center, which is very cool. Uh, we have computer bus up here, zero through 17. So that is set up for 18 bits, but I imagine you only use zero through 15 for this machine, which is a 16 bit machine. Uh, then we have some, some basic timing signals. Somebody put a, uh, little test piece of wire in CL2 there. We'll go ahead and pull that out. Uh, then we have start, stop, uh, HTC halt, sequence control, instruction control, run, repeat, test mode, set R and U, arithmetic control, set APBX, select APBX. This is how you would go about servicing this machine when it was in use, absolute madness. I have absolutely no idea how we're ever going to make this work, but uh, <laughs> that's a challenge I'm willing to undertake. <laughs> There we go, you've now been introduced to our new friend, the Data 620, and uh, boy, it is 
huge. I really have to rethink my lens and camera placing <laughs> options because this thing is so massive. It's well over six feet tall. But I'm very excited to have this machine in here because it fills an interesting void that we had in this room. We have a full vacuum tube computer with rotating drum memory in the form of the Bendix G15. And then we have a full TTL computer with, uh, again, rotating drum memory in the form of the Litten. And then we have the next evolution beyond that which was a uh, TTL bit slice AM2901 architecture with uh, DRAM on it, which was the which is the uh, Centurion over there with really big spinny hard drives on it. But we didn't have anything filling that void that was fully transistorized until now. This is a fully transistorized computer, not a single IC on it. It fills that gap between vacuum tube computers like the Bendix G15 and integrated circuit computers like the Litten and the Centurion. So it's really cool to have that historical lineage here in the room. Now the uh, Data620 here, as you can see, needs a ton of work. Uh, there's a lot of things that I'm really not happy with, even with it just sitting like this, particularly the panel gaps here. This is driving me bonkers, but uh, well, Everybody say hello to our new friend, NASA-kun. Uh, NASA-kun just means Mr. NASA. And this is indeed a genuine NASA machine. Aside from the little sticker down here that we have on the power supply, there's another sticker right up here on the CPU. So again, further evidence that this, that this was used in the 1960s at NASA. Now, what was it used on exactly? We have no way of knowing. We didn't get any uh, stored programs with this. As a matter of fact, we didn't even get any way to read stored programs. There is no magnetic tape unit that came with it. There's no paper tape uh, reader that came with it. We got nothing. This is pretty much what we got. We did get a spare core memory unit and we got a spare drawer uh, that didn't have any cards in it. But, well, core memory is interesting because it's non-volatile which means there could possibly be a program stored in the memory still. The question is, is did NASA zero out the core memory before they put the machine up for sale at uh, NASA surplus? And well, the uh, pragmatic side of me says, yeah, absolutely, of course they did. They were NASA, they uh, crossed their T's and dotted their I's, but Man, the hopeful side of me says, who knows, maybe there's some kind of rocket launch control or test program still hiding out in there. The only problem is, is that we only get one shot to read it because reads are destructive. We're gonna have to do a lot of reading and research to figure out how to back up the contents of the core memory if there is even anything in there. So that's the future for this, but it's going to be a very long time before we get to it because we have a ton of great stuff coming up in 2024, and this was kind of an unexpected grab. So it's going to get pushed a little further down the list. Um, and well, I waffled very heavily on whether to bring you guys along and introduce this to you, even though we weren't going to get into it for a very long time to come. But I figured, well, it's huge, it's not exactly inconspicuous, and it required a massive uh, rearrangement of the room, which took up a full nine days of my life. So I figured I'd bring you guys along on that journey. And uh, well, I hope you enjoyed watching me uh, throw my back out trying to get this big beast in here. And uh, I wanna thank you very much for watching this year in 2023, and we have a whole lot more exciting stuff coming in 2024. So I hope to see you then.